our Father and our God. We praise you and we give you thanks for your sustaining presence. We pray for this gathering that you will guide us with your wisdom. We ask that you, Lord, will so inspire your servant, Robert, Bishop of our church, to lead us and to guide us in our discussions and conversation. Lord, we pray for the mission of the church. Grant us a renewed strength and courage to pursue the proclamation of the gospel and the good news of your kingdom, Lord. Enable us, Lord, to witness to your grace and love revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, enable us to open ourselves to gain new insight and understanding pertaining to the sacrament of the church. And grant, Lord, that all will seek to benefit so that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In and through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Beloved sisters and brothers, Right Reverend Robert McLean Thompson has been a part of the leadership of our church for many decades. I don't believe he needs any introduction. He's presently retiring, experiencing retirement and enjoying the cool breeze coming in from the seashore of Clarendon, in the company of his wife and his granddaughter. It is not a time that he is able to sit back. I'm certain that retirement, I'm told, means that it's just a lot more work. So Bishop Robert, welcome. We thank you for accepting our invitation as we focus on this pressing matter of uh, baptism, the gateway to the Eucharist, and all the antecedent issues that accompany with it in that of, in that of confirmation. So over to you, Bishop. Can you unmute Bishop? Well, thank you very much. The very Reverend Dean. <laughs> well, let me, let me first of all commend you to my prayers and congratulate you. I um I I I like the, the new the new hairdo while your sons are are um bringing you up in life, man. <laughs> Working with it, Bishop. Work with it, work with it, work with it. Colleagues and friends, thank you for the opportunity of sharing. And I do really hope that it, it will be an opportunity for sharing on, on a subject matter that has created quite, quite um, well, not quite a stir, but it has, it has created quite a challenge because it is, it is pressing us to do deep reflection. And the question that a lot of people are asking is, what do we do with confirmation? If baptism now becomes the gateway for Holy Communion. You know, that, that, that has been a question that has in fact occupied the minds of the church since the second century. If we have time, um, later on, we will talk a little bit about confirmation, but I can make reference 
uh, to where we could go and have a look at, at studies that have been done on that because various doctrinal commissions and reports have concluded that water baptism alone is complete as the initiation into the life of the body of Christ, into the communion, child or adult. The consensus of opinion is that confirmation, the laying on of hands, whilst having a pastoral role in the renewal of faith among the baptized, is no longer seen as the gateway to communion. That basically is a principle on which the House of Bishops recommended to the Provincial Synod in 2019 that the principle of accepting baptism as a gateway for communion be accepted. I, I, like most of you, have grown up to, to believe because we were taught that confirmation com and Holy Communion completes the process of initiation into the life of Christ and in, in the life of the church. Um, scripture itself does not support that. And that's what we are going to be looking at and examining, examining this evening. Um, I want to start by, by reading the declaration of the baptismal service. I, I know we have spent weeks, um, some five, six weeks, looking at the whole matter of baptism. And I don't necessarily want to rehash that. But I will have to speak in my own, in my introductory remarks about baptism itself. But let me just read again with something which is known by, to all of us. In holy baptism, the church proclaims the good news of our incorporation into the kingdom of God. A kingdom which Jesus Christ, our incarnate Lord, inaugurated by his life of perfect trust and obedience to the Father. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he brought into being a people for his own possession, which people we are. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are united with Christ in holy baptism, sharing not only in his death, but also in his resurrection, becoming God's children by adoption and grace thus changing our created nature so deeply that the Holy Scripture says that in baptism we are born again. Let us therefore pray that those who have come for baptism may receive in this holy sacrament that blessing which by nature they cannot have, that they be made living members of the church, which is the body of Christ, and so be set free from the bondage of sin. I think that sets it out. That sets it out very much. You know, but many people, including Anglicans, are challenged by the practice of infant baptism. Since babies are not in a position to confess their sins. And if we are, then certainly we will have difficulty in accepting our belovedness, even when we ourselves don't feel particularly near to God. Faith is not a matter of choosing what we believe, as if one were a consumer in a spiritual supermarket. Faith is our response to the astonishing discovery that we have been chosen. Paul did not weigh up the arguments for and against Christianity and then make a mature option for Jesus. God burst into his life and threw him to the ground. He heard a voice, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Acts chapter 9 verse 5. Paul did not have much to say in the matter. So God's choice of us precedes our choice of God. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the reparation of our sins. The matter of Christianity and our participation in the life of Christ you know, gives us a lot of resources and strength to do a number of things. And that becomes problematic sometimes. We regret to say that, in fact, we can't do anything about that choice that God has made by calling us to be his sons and daughters. Not even our sins can make a difference to that. The only thing that makes Uh, I was muted. I didn't do anything to mute myself. Where where did I I pick up somewhere? Can somebody pick me up? Because I, I, I just saw my mute on. The only thing that makes some difference. Perhaps it wasn't long. Yes, I say that. Uh, let, me, let me let me read something from um being Christian. Baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and prayer. I don't know if any of you have had this book. Have I seen it? Anyway, can't. But let me read. Let me read. Allow me to do that. Throughout Christian history, there have been plenty of debates around baptism. In the early church, people debated whether it was possible to sin after baptism. The great temptation was to think that when you had entered the new creation, the old world just stopped existing. St. Paul knew that temptation. He also knew very well that the old world is tough, a natural survivor, and that the old humanity muddled about its destiny and forgetful about its true nature goes on with remarkable persistence. So if, as a baptized person, you still sin, don't panic. Remember that the depths of God's love still surround you. And when you sin as a baptized person, you are not, as it were, stepping right outside the depths of God's love. Unless, of course, unless, of course, you fully and consciously decide to do so. Rather, it is as though you are deliberately ignoring the depths all around you and not letting the reality of the world's needs and the reality of God's love come through. So what you need to do is to take shutters down again and you will find that every prayer of penitence that you pray is a taking down of the shutters and letting the baptismal depths well up around and within you again. I think that that is important because, you know, I've heard people saying, well, all right, the kid was baptized in, in infancy when the child not aware of what was happening. Um, so we need confirmation in order to, to solidify the relation. I've even heard a bishop. I can tell you I've had a, and it was right there at Ascension. I was a young priest, brash and stupid. And I challenged the then diocesan bishop uh, Bishop D'Souza about that. And Bishop D'Souza said, because I, I, I've long felt 
that baptism is authentically the gateway for Holy Communion because it is complete in its initiation. And I remember when I tried to defend that, Bishop D'Souza said to me, why throw the bread to the dogs? Uh, referring, of course, to that scriptural passage. And in fact, Jesus would very much answer that question for us. The idea was that only when we get confirmed are we in a position not only to affirm our faith, but to know exactly what we are receiving in terms of the body and blood of Christ. And to do, to, to administer that before you get to that point, um, would in fact be throwing bread to the dogs. Infant baptism expresses the utter primacy of God's love. This precedes anything that we do or say. So when next you are called upon to defend the tradition of nearly all major churches of baptizing infants, remember what God said to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. To be baptized is to claim the humanity that God intended. The world can rob us of affirming something that God has already done. And that is why we need to be immersed within the Christian community that can constantly help to remind us of our true humanity that God intends. And that's where the church community comes in. And that's the major challenge. How do we nurture the baptized into the faith so that they claim that identity throughout their entire life? As Christians, we proclaim that we are children of God and share in the life of God. It is through the sacrament of baptism that that identity is affirmed. This I suggest must be our starting point on any discussion on baptism as a gateway to the sacrament of Holy Communion. But it doesn't end there. The church has not always known how best to obey Christ's command to let the children come to me. And it is only quite slowly that the Anglican church in various countries have begun to open the question of the admission of the baptized, of baptized children to Holy Communion. The CPWI House of Bishops, having decided to further this practice, must now engage in developing guidelines for such a practice. Without that, the congregations and parishes and priests and leadership at the local level will remain, if not confused, certainly undirected in terms of how to proceed. I would therefore suggest that we follow the theological conversations on confirmation and establish some guidelines. I haven't been following, I haven't seen, I really haven't had access to the booklet that has been produced by the diocese or the province. And I suspect it may have guidelines in it. But I'm assuming, since I haven't seen it, that that does not presently exist. The guideline, I, I went to the website of the Anglican Church in Wales. Um, and i just briefly share with you some of the guidelines that they have produced for admission of baptized children to Holy Communion. And that was to take effect from October 2001. The House of Bishops wishes to author, well, number one, 
the author, House of Bishops wishes to authorize parishes to admit baptized children to Holy Communion, provided that the proposal has received appropriate support from the clergy and from the parishioners. And I think this is why congregations, parishes, and deaners like yourself have invited this conversation to take place so that the faithful across the board can be alerted to what is about to take place. Secondly, the parish clergy and the church, the, the church committees, respective church committees, those engaged in ministry with children should actively be involved in the introduction and implementation of these new practices within the parish. Thirdly, before a scheme is introduced in a parish, it is desirable that as many parishioners as possible understand the reasons for the new practice. Resources and materials should be shared and produced by each diocese so that they will become, they will prove to be useful information at the local level. The admission of children to Holy Communion should be seen as part of the congregation's whole program for nurture in the Christian faith. An appropriate period of preparation for children and parents, sponsors, should precede it. I just pause here. Um, my wife, Shamin, was a Roman Catholic, and she is the godparent for many of our nieces who were baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. And over a two-year period, had to be present at the first in the Roman Catholic Church, they have first communion classes. And the godparents would have to attend those classes over a two-year period before they were allowed to take communion. So whether it's at age eight or 10 or wherever, or even before that, there is a period of instruction and that has to be supported by adult members of the congregation, or in this instance, um, godparents. You know, I have often, since being a bishop, and I have done, I have done baptisms, but in practice, I try very much to decline the request. Because baptism, even if it is done outside of the Eucharist on a Sunday morning, it should be done within the context of a, par of a, of a parish, a congregation, where the nurturing can take place. I think, I think we, have, we, have, we have relaxed pretty much um, in that area of oversight. And, and Christian nurture. Blessed be God forever. The program produced by the, by many um, provinces and dioceses that, that um, have adopted this practice of baptism being the gateway to Holy Communion is something that we can, we can visit several of these websites and see what they're doing. Parish should ensure that the children admitted to Holy Communion have the active support of parents, sponsors, and other members of the congregation. Infants are baptized and children are admitted to Holy Communion in the expectation that they will wish to seek confirmation in due course. When a child communicant moves home, the clergy 
of the new parish should be informed of the child's communicant status. The child should be received as a communicant in the new parish and communicant status should not be withdrawn. Children should normally be admitted to Holy Communion for the first time at a Sunday celebration. A simple form of admission such as that prepared by the Provincial Children's Committee may be used. The emphasis should be a celebratory rather than interrogatory. A record of names of those admitted to Holy Communion should be kept with the parish registry. The Church of Wales, from whom I have gotten these guidelines, um, suggests that all these should be collated and published um, within a diocesan registry. When appointing clergy to parishes authorized to admit children to Holy Communion, full account should be taken of the existence of these practices. I want to stop there and invite questions and conversations. And if we have time towards the end, we will speak a little bit about the role of confirmation. Because if baptism now takes the place of uh, the no window or door to Holy Communion, then what becomes of confirmation and even of the role of the bishop. Some of you have heard me speak about that, you know. And you have heard me speak about the role of, of the bishop. Certainly, I feel I, um, I, I can speak because nobody's, nobody's paying me attention anymore. But I do feel that Suffragan bishops, for example, since they have a regional seas, should undergo a course um, in congregational development. And they would take on the role of helping to resource congregations. This is not anything new, you know. This is what happens in the Episcopal Church. That's why your suffragan bishops, in fact, call the bishops. Um, that, for me, would be a most useful exercise to take on so that bishops are not seen only as visiting a, par a parish when they are invited to, to have confirmation and they move on. Uh, that becomes an event rather than uh, a process of nurture within the life of the church. I know I'm speaking, many of you are lay leaders, many of you are clergy who have important role within the life of the diocese and you begin to have those conversations. But thank you, you have, you have heard me talking now for at least 15, 20 minutes. So I, I will end there and open for conversation. Thank you very much, Bishop, for um, leading us in this um, conversation about baptism as a gateway to the Eucharist. Um, you have really addressed a, a number of issues. So I don't know. Ask the participants, and we have about 92, um, if they could just raise their hands um, so that we we can get them to to express what is the um, the question they would like you to address. So if they could go to the bottom of their screen and they will see uh, the icon and it has um, reaction, they could just press on it and raise their hands so that we can facilitate their question.
I see there are Sandra Knight. Sandra Knight. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Sandra Knight. Could you um, state your name and which um, congregation you're from? I'm Sandra Knight Reese, and I belong to the Church of St. Mary the Virgin. Um, I listened to our bishop speak about the issue of baptism as a gateway to Holy Communion. Now, if, that, if, if confirmation is to be put away with in favor of baptism as a gateway to Holy Communion, should we not be, if we're going to put away the whole issue of access through confirmation, maybe we should be thinking about reconsidering infant baptism. If if the child still has to, at some stage, make the choice to confirm their own um, interest in the Christian life, why don't we think of blessing babies, nurturing them in the church, and having them choose to be baptized at an appropriate age instead of confirmation, if confirmation is to be put away with? Why, in, why should we infant baptize if there's no other mechanism in place for the child to choose. Um, I don't know if you came in late, but I, I in fact believe I answered that question in, in my earlier comments about um, certainly the call of the prophet Jeremiah, even the call of, of Saul. Um, we heard a voice Saul didn't have any choice in, in, in his conversion and his call. Um, you know, it's a subject, I know it's a hard one for us because certainly we are, we are in a culture. We are, we are in a culture where, um, and not only because we've been influenced largely by, by a culture that says, well, look, you don't baptize until someone is, is conscious about his or her sins and can repent and, 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 and accept and know consciously what they're doing. Um, and you know, there are so many decisions that we make for, say, for our children before they know. Most of us who are uh, professionals and intelligent and who have children, we register children at our schools long before they know even, even they're aware of, of, of where they are to go and why they are to go there. But, but we make those decisions because it's a collective decision that we make. Part of the problem we have in terms of infant baptism is that quite often we more or less send children to be baptized with grandparents or somebody else. And we ourselves as members of the family, um, members of the community don't take collective responsibility for the nurture in that. And I think that is where we need to spend some time and discipline ourselves in dealing with that. Uh, Sandra, did you get a response? I got the response, but honestly speaking, I am, I am pro what we do right now. If you baptize a child, they become part of the church, they grow in the church, and then they confirm when they're ready. I just don't understand why we dispense with that system if there's no, if, if we see that it nurture is lacking, then if we baptize infants, at what stage do we just take them to the altar to receive communion and hope that at some stage they really do mature into Christian life? What mechanism would be there to do what is happening now, which is what, you know, infant baptize, you nurture them. Right. I, I just don't see what the replacement is. I'm not clear on that. I don't think we're replacing anything. We're not even replacing confirmation. 
Um, what we are saying here is, in fact, baptism completes our initiation into the life of Jesus Christ and into the body of, and into the church. In the, in the baptism of Jesus and or on Holy Saturday, Easter Eve, When, the, when that child is baptized, soon after birth, the, the child is also anointed, as is also the case with, um, with the practice in our church today. They are, and they, and they received communion. The infant child receives communion. All three actions take place on the same occasion for the infant child in the Orthodox religion. And, and perhaps I should say a little bit about the role of confirmation, which may help to clarify you, but somebody else may have a question on the presentation that I made before I get to that. Um, Canon, if you allow that, if you allow, I see a hand up there and we could respond to that. And I'll come eventually, Sandra, you, 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 may, you may get your answer. But I'm not suggesting that, that, and the church and the bishops are not suggesting that we do away with confirmation. Confirmation will take on a different meaning, perhaps the, the appropriate and right meaning within the life of the church. Uh, so Sandra, listen out for that response from Bishop Robert. I see the, uh, the hand of John Phillips. John Phillips, could you unmute your mic and express your question to the bishop, please. Yes, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, give us your name and your congregation, please. Yes, um, John Phillips, uh, Church of the Resurrection, um, that's in Duane Park, part of this um, St. Mary the Virgin Cure. Now, um, I've listened carefully to Bishop and I understand what he's saying. My question is, is with the age, for example, um, the Eucharist, the, 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 um, the blood is alcoholic. I am I'm pretty certain it is strong. Now, at what age would a child be allowed to participate in the Eucharist um, consuming alcohol at that strength? One. And uh, secondly, what age would you, um, seeing that um, the bishop spoke, bishop spoke on, on nurturing and all of that, who determines when that child is ready for, um, for participating in the Eucharist? Um, who, who, where, at what, what's the guideline on the age at which that child would be allowed to participate? I, I don't know. If, is that in... Uh, let me ask you, Canon, that uh, does that is that included in the booklet that has been prepared? I don't believe um, that is included in the booklet, Bishop. All right. All right, John, let me just say say a couple of things about, about that and about the age. That is to be determined. And and whatever age is is decided on. I would say, from where my perspective, that's arbitrary. Um, my three-year-old granddaughter spends quite a bit of time with us, and she wants to see Jesus. She she wants to engage in prayer. She wants to. She can't even talk well, but she wants to sing. Um, I I don't know. I I am. I I told a group a story. When I was rector at St. Andrew Parish Church, I presented a, in court, a mongoloid for confirmation. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, 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 the political correct term is draw, uh, Down syndrome. I presented her for, for confirmation. I explained to the bishop why that person didn't go through confirmation preparation. She was baptized because she grew up in a Christian family. 
and it, I would always go and visit her mother um, to administer the communion. And from the very first time, when the family would prevent her from attending while I'm giving communion to the mother, I would, I would resist that and I would invite her in. And over the years, her attentiveness indicated to me that this is someone who God is reaching and I could not quite determine how. And for me, it really didn't matter how. And I presented her for that. You know, after her confirmation, she insisted that a family member took her to church every Sunday. She couldn't speak. She could hear. And she could engage in the sacrament. I tell the story because I don't, I, sometimes I think we try to, to over, <laughs> over plan this thing. And, you know, there are some things we should leave to God um, in, this, in this instance. So the matter of age is to be determined. I think the House of Bishops will do that. But in any event, what is even more important than the age is the family and the community participating in their nurture. Too often, we baptize children with very limited preparation of that family in making them know what they are the obligations in have bringing a child for baptism. I did something, and you know, as a young priest, you would do crazy things. I don't know that I would do it now. But I remember a young couple came and they were married and they brought their child for baptism. And they could not, in fact, they could not, in fact, well, they were not convinced why they were bringing their child for baptism. They were doing it because the grandparents says it must be done. And they couldn't commit themselves to taking the child to church and helping to nurture the child in the faith. And I said to them, look, it is right for me to suggest that you should postpone this matter of the child's baptism until you are ready to make that commitment. Because baptism is not a magical um, something but that to protect the child and so on. You know, God is going to protect the child whether the child is baptized or not. Agreed. Baptism is an affirmation of the child's identity as a child of God, and that child must grow up claiming it. Uh, Bishop, although mm -hmm. the booklet doesn't indicate um, age, um, it does state that the parents and the priest Mm -hmm. um, make the decision when the child is ready to um, receive Holy Communion. It okay. is the parents of the child and the priest who, um, who, who make the make decision that determination. When the, when the determination when the child is ready. Um, and I think that that's a right believe, decision. Yes, I, I do believe that this conversation has been going on as, as far back as I know it from the 60s and 70s. Um, and when I was um, ordained in 1980, um, three years at St. Andraham Parish Church with the then Father Herman Spence, and then um, five years in Highgate, uh, a rural parish, was always an issue. The issue of um, nurturing, the, the issue of uh, the preparation. And if you set aside and say your parents and godparents must come for preparation for three months, then in a number of instances, they, they will conform. I think in terms of their needs in going forward, clearly, as I'm understanding it from a few clergy, there has to be a protocol in which the, when a child is to be baptized, that we, 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 we have to fill out some forms that will have to go to the diocese and bishop, and we have to expand the present form 
it will have to include a lot more questions. And uh, when that is done, it goes to the diocese and bishop, who would then, because it, it means that the diocese and bishop, or maybe the regional bishop, but I do believe the diocese and bishop is a key person because when we want confirmation to be done, we have to write to the diocese and bishop. And uh, that will assist in establishing some platform on which all priests will have to conform to a protocol. So it's not that the situation we are presently for confirmation in some cures and congregation, the preparation is about three months. For some, it is six months. For others, it is from September to, um, to April, May, like at St. Andrew. But the protocol that goes across the board, which will apply to all the priests in the diocese. That, that I think needs to be put in the mix as we, as we go forward in relation to uh, baptism as a gateway um, to the Eucharist. Um, I see uh, Thomas would like to ask a question. Could you share with us your name and the congregation you're from? My name is Vilia Thomas. I'm from the church in Margaret in Ligany. Um, just a quick comment with regards to the, the gentleman's concern about um, children, you know, um, at a young age and whether, you know, you, um, the, the, cons the consuming of alcohol. I think that just a thought popped into here that a very simple way of handling that is that you just dip the, 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 the wafer in, in the wine instead of letting them sip, you know, <laughs> take a slug of, 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 the, of, the, of the wine. Just dip it and, and then you put it on the child's the child's tongue. And I think that, I mean, pretty much any age, you can, you know, you decide how much you dip it, <laughs> you know, pretty much any age could be handled, you know, a protocol could be established where children are concerned, how you handle that kind of way. So that's just my little two pence I'm putting in. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But right now we're not having any alcohol at all. Right. At the moment, during this, this pandemic, we go that for communion. We receive the host, mm -hmm. and we are told that mm -hmm. the host is complete in receiving yeah. the because the host includes the blood. Yeah. We are told that we'll get in, back fact, to in, in many jurisdictions, they don't receive the cup at all. So that would not be a problem, John. Um, and so Thank we have, much, Thank you. yeah, we have dealt with that issue. I would like to remind all of us of the, the premise and the ground of baptism. In baptism, I was made a member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. In baptism, I was made a member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor of God's kingdom. So in baptism, infant or adult, we are accepted by God. We are incorporated into the family of God. We are grafted into the nature of God and we are accepted at the Lord's table. We need to remind ourselves of that which I've just expressed, which is the foundation and the understanding of what baptism is. Once we get that clarity, once it is clear in our minds that baptism incorporates us into Christ, we become a part of the family of God. And we are inheritors of God's kingdom. Also in baptism, we are grafted into the very nature of God. So that our human nature is absorbed into God's uncreated nature. For we are initiated into the faith of Jesus Christ. 
Let us keep that in mind. We are initiated into the faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the God-man, the incarnate one. So that is very, very critical to our understanding of what baptism is. So baptism initiates us into the family of God. We are incorporated into Christ and we become inheritors, beneficiaries of what Christ did for us. It also, brothers and sisters, facilitates our relationship with God. That relationship which has to be nurtured. And that's why we talk about the parents and the godparents. And so the process of baptism going forward will require that the congregation and the priests be a lot more discerning when persons ask for an infant to be baptized, to engage the applicant or the seeking person in a conversation. What is it you're asking? What is it you're seeking? And out of that engagement, there will come some understanding of what is it they're seeking. Sometimes they just want the child to be blessed. If that is so, then we do the blessing of a child on a Sunday. So come on a Sunday morning and that will be done. When you have gone in the conversation to really explore the different aspects of uh, baptism. I see a hand up. Um, St. Clair. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Where are you good from? Evening. Uh, name is Eliza St. Clair, a.k.a. Lenz, Church of St. Mary the Virgin, 99 Mullines Road. Yes. What, what, what I see here, um, um, I am with it. And what it, it, it seems to do or will be doing is to put more responsibility on me. So my, my, my children were not christened, were not baptized as infants. And I, I, I grew them up in, 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 in the word and they had a choice at some point in time when they were ready. Now, I have a younger one. Um, she is now 12, and I'm preparing her now for confirmation and baptism. Now, if, oh, oh I'm sorry for my dog. If at some point in time, um, she's not ready after six months, or I don't think she is ready, I don't think it, uh, it, it would be wise to bring her to the bishop or, or, or to father to, to take her to the bishop. Is, is that where we're going? Is, is it, uh, are you now coming somewhere where I think I was long ago? You sound like you're a reading man. And I would like to introduce you to Rowan Williams book, Being Christian. Yes. Baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and prayer. Right. Um, I, I am not your pastor, so I have to be very careful how I, how I advise you. I think, though, that you are putting up yourself... Uh, to play a role in your child's life about being ready. Ready for what? I, I, I don't know if you were here earlier when, when I read that whole part from, from Rowan Williams there. Um, we are baptized, but we are still sinners. And, and I get a little nervous when we talk about that 
being ready, but I would want you to have a conversation with me outside of the Zoom because you and I could take up the rest of the half an hour that we have left. I want to deal with some of the things in terms of confirmation. That would be nice, sir. You started out me um, with the lay preacher training, so you can figure right. me with it. Yeah, I would like very much to to engage you on it, so you can get get my get my contact, my WhatsApp contact from your rector, and um, all right, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. At least, right. Thank you. I see that there is a, another hand up. And I would like to remind us, sisters and brothers, of what I've just stated. I hopefully some of you have been able to write it down um, pertaining to the whole issue of baptism. That in baptism, we are made a member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor of God's kingdom. That also in baptism, we are grafted into the very nature of God. So we need to understand it, that in baptism also, we are accepted by God. God stretches out his loving arms to embrace us, and it is not dependent on our cognitive ability or our capacity to discern or reason. God's love is not dependent on those things. It is God who takes the initiative to embrace us as we are baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus who lived that life in perfect response to God the Father. I see uh, Valerie Lawrence. Could you share with us? A hand is up. Good night. Good night, Valerie Lawrence, St. Luke's Church. I know the conversation has been is being centered around the children, but I'm just wondering right now we do not give communion to non-Anglicans. Would that change? Persons who are coming from other churches who have been baptized, they're, they're adults, they would like to switch their membership. How is that going to be treated? Bishop Robert? Unmute, please, Bishop. Could you unmute? You need to unmute, Bishop. The House of Bishops, in fact, is, is contemplating that, that very question. A determination has not been fully made. But certainly, it would have implications for that. If baptism, for example, if a, baptized, if a bap member of the Baptist Church or of the Pentecostal Church had been baptized, um, were to become a, a member of the church or a visitor, would they be welcome to the table? In some instances, they have been before, but that, that's a determination that has to be made by the bishops sitting as members of the doctrinal commission of the province and they will make a determination. And I suspect that that determination will be made in conjunction with, with um, the ruling that the next provincial synod, which is due next year, will in fact make. It, it seems logical that we'll have to go in that direction. Um, I, I would like, because, because the whole matter of confirmation and what do we do with it, is, is certainly a critical component of the conversation that we are having. Um, if, if there are no other burning issues, I would like to, to, um, to just read from some notes that have been prepared here. What was confirmation? The varied practice of praying for a newly baptized person with anointing and laying on of hands as a sign of the ongoing strength of the Holy Spirit for new life begun in water of baptism. Down the ages, what did it become as it responded to contemporary needs? The popular view of confirmation 
is that it is a rite of commitment which imparts the Holy Spirit, dismisses the newly baptized, and is the Episcopal stamp on church membership. That really is the crux of the matter. However, this rite, which is used throughout the Anglican Communion, has had a checkered history. Unlike baptism and the Eucharist, it was not instituted by Christ. And scriptural evidence is scanty and controversial. Confirmation originated from the post-baptismal anointing called chrismation and our imposition of hands during the single rite of initiation. Jesus commissioned his disciples to baptize in the name of the Trinity. Although the New Testament writers say much about the significance of baptism, they provide little liturgical detail. In the Acts of the Apostles, there are nine references to baptism. But post-baptismal laying on of hands occurs only in two. The Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, verses 12 to, 20 to 17, and the disciples at Ephesus. <coughs> the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, has frequently been cited as evidence for confirmation. However, the consensus of opinion is that the early Christians were initiated simply by water baptism. And additional ceremonies like imposition of hands may have occurred in some churches, but cannot be said to have been the norm. By the second century, a baptismal rite had emerged. And according to the writings of Justin Martyr, in AD 160, fasting, prayer, and instruction preceded it. The candidate was immersed in cold running water or just sprinkled three times with water in the name of the Trinity. By AD 200, post-baptismal ceremonies such as the anointing or chrismation and imposition of hands had been added to the baptismal rite which had emerged. By the fourth century, initiation had become shrouded shrouded in secrecy, the details of the ceremony, the Eucharist, the creed, and the Lord's Prayer were a closely guarded secret. Initiation took place during the Easter Vigil and was preceded by a three-year catechumenate. Meanwhile, the rite of baptism, the baptism, had acquired many additional ceremonies, including chrismation, signing of the cross, and washing of the candidate's feet by the bishop. The person thus initiated was vested in a white garment and carrying a lighted candle was led into the Eucharist to receive the First Communion. In some churches, they were also given a drink of milk and honey to symbolize entry into the Promised Land. The imparting of the spirit evolved in different forms. Imposition of hands and the blessing, the anointing, imposition, and signing with the cross, and the kiss of peace, or imposition, anointing, and believe that the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit were imparted at, at this time. These were obviously the origins of what became the confirmation rite. In the Eastern Church, as I mentioned earlier, up to the present day, infants are baptized, anointed, and communicated with the Eucharist by the priest using Episcopally blessed chrism oil. <laughs> you know, a pause here. So I was ordained, what, 40 or many years ago? Oh my goodness, 47 years ago, 48 years ago, in another 
few days. And as a priest, I didn't, we didn't use oil um, at baptism. We were not allowed to use oil at baptism. We just simply use the water and pour the water and the baptize and, and give the, the, the lighted candle. No. So we have evolved. We have evolved as a church, as a diocese, liturgically at baptism, the priest, the oils are blessed on Holy Thursday by the bishop. The priest would come with their various containers and receive the oil for chrismation and use that at baptism to anoint, which really, I am um, at an earlier session with, with a group, I mentioned the name Adian Kavanagh. Adian Kavanagh, um, a Roman Catholic, I was privileged to sit at his feet when I was on sabbatical, doing a sabbatical at Yale University. And Kavanagh in his lecture there, and now recorded in a book, spoke about um, the matter of Christian initiation, which begins with baptism in the, in the Orthodox Church, and the bishop would sit in his chair. After the baptism, the priest would take the, um, the newly baptized to the bishop to be anointed. And that completes it. They would receive communion. Now, oils are blessed by the bishop. And the priest, certainly in our diocese, would use that oil at baptism to complete with the sign of the cross. Um, sing, signaling the reception of the Holy Spirit. Church, the pattern of initiation was influenced by several factors. I just briefly mentioned those. Firstly, Augustine, year 430. Through his doctrine of original sin, he promoted infant baptism within a week of birth, often by the midwife or a member of the family. Consequently, confirmation would be deferred until the bishop was available. The norm was that the few people regarded this additional ceremony as a completion of baptism or necessary to salvation. A stage was ultimately reached when confirmation was only administered if the bishop was in the vicinity, and often from horseback or carriages to people standing in the fields afar, rather than hands being laid on each individual. A bit untidy. Next, Archbishop Peckham in 1281 tried to regularize this situation by enforcing confirmation prior to communion. This legislation failed, however, and this practice of the baptized but unconfirmed receiving Holy Communion continued through the Middle Ages up to the 16th century until it was banned by the Council of Trent in 1547. Thus, the structure inherited by the 16th century reformers was that what had been one rite of initiation had a true practice become three separate stages, baptism and confirmation, followed by communion. That is what you and I have inherited. But you see that, in fact, it is something that has evolved. During the Reformation, a much stricter line became the norm, and some understanding was a prerequisite to receiving communion. Subsequently, in 1549, Cranmer produced a separate rite of confirmation in which the candidate had to be able to recite the creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. This rite was administered to children who had come to that age when they began to be in danger to fall into sin. Confirmation gave them strength and defense 
against all temptations to sin and the assault of the world and the devil. <laughs> so friends, we, uh, I don't know if that is what is really the bother for some of us because a question was really asked, you know, okay, fine. What are we going to do with confirmation when in fact, at some point, we need to have that child or that adult standing up and say, look, I believe I am ready to affirm my faith in Jesus Christ. That can still happen. And a place for confirmation can be made, a case for it within the life of the church, certainly in terms of affirming one's identity as a Christian and as a Christian disciple. Receiving that as an indication that one is entering into, into a new ministry within the life of the church. Confirmation came to be regarded either as a complete initiation or as a non-sacramental catechumical rite. This too viewpoint coexisted whilst the ritual remained the same, confirmation before communion. This pattern worked well when baptism and confirmation were well rooted in popular religion. However, after the Second World War, there grew an increasing disparity between numbers for baptism and confirmation. Also, the right of confirmation had also become a graduation from the church. The Lamb Lambeth Conference of 1968 subsequently presented a report which voiced concern over the traditional pattern of initiation. And the question has been debated throughout the Anglican community at various levels over the past 30 years. Various doctrinal commissions and reports have concluded then that water baptism alone is complete initiation and in principle admits a person, child or adult, to Holy Communion. Notwithstanding what I have said there, I think it's very important that probably one of you need to do that to go and research and establish and recommend to the diocesan bishop some principles under which we may begin to shape guidelines for parishes to adopt as we move towards baptism, especially where children are concerned as a gateway for communion. Thank you very much. Bishop, you have, you have just, again, um, you have, you have you have connected with what I stated about establishing some new some new protocols that will be uh, required for all the clergy to adhere to in terms of uh, baptism um, as a gateway to the to the to the Eucharist. Um, it is was mentioned by you that uh, the confirmation as we have it in the, in the prayer book, that is a 1662 prayer book formulated by Cramner, um, that, that confirmation is something as practiced then as continued to be practiced within the church, is something we have inherited. However, the baptism of infants as a complete rite has been a part of the church before the reformation. You know, it is something we have always had as a part of our heritage, that infants are baptized, as you mentioned, the oil chrism, which has been consecrated by the bishop on Monday, Thursday, is used to anoint the child after baptism to indicate that the Holy Spirit now takes a permanent place within the the, 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 the life within the, um, within the child. 
and, 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 and so the child becomes a part of the body of Christ, a part of the church, and is entitled to everything that we, we, we have uh, as a church. So you're, you're quite right. We will need to establish some new protocols uh, pertaining to baptism as a gateway to the Eucharist and also to recognize that confirmation as we have practiced it since the Reformation really provides some potency that demands persons being prepared. Now, when you no longer need to be prepared for confirmation in order to receive sa the sacrament, what potency will we give that right that will demand persons coming to the church to experience some formation um, in order for them to one, uh, publicly express their and affirm their identity in Christ. And secondly, to express that they now take on a ministry within the church. Um, are you with me on that, Bishop? Oh, obviously, yes. I mean, I think so. I, I, um, I, that is where we could very well locate confirmation. Um, I, I, I'm willing to write a paper on, on that matter, certainly when we talk about Christian discipleship and training for Christian discipleship. I, I, um, I attended a confirmation in, in England some years ago, a confirmation service. And these were just adults who were being confirmed. And there were six candidates <coughs> and all six so Bishop's sermon was very short, but all six candidates had to speak to the congregation about their commitment to Christ, the journey that they have taken from baptism as children into adulthood and moving into, into Christian witness. Um, Hello? Hmm. Uh, thank you, Bishop Robert. Um, I would see that in the chat something has been mentioned. And to just to say that the Anglican Church has practiced infant baptism and seen it as a part of the initiation process. Now, from the Synod of Whitby 664, the Anglican Church endorsed the Catholic practice of infant baptism as a sacrament the, to which one is initiated, infant or adult. Now, as I mentioned, the whole issue of confirmation is a post-reformation uh, practice that entered the church and was formulated by Thomas Cramner in the prayer book that, well, which preceded the present one, that red one that we have, the old prayer book. And so what we are doing now as an Anglican church within the province and the diocese is to go back to that which has always been a part of our church. I would like to say to the person, it is not something new. It has always been a part of our church. It's just that at the Reformation, we took a particular turn. And so now we are recognizing that we need to return to that practice, which has always been a part of our church. Uh, I see a question by um, St. Clair, Eliza, please. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening again. Uh, Lens. St. Mary the Virgin, 99 Molines Road. Uh, I remember Canon Ernley Garden, before he became Canon, had some writings on baptism. 
and 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 I think we might need to um, go and dig up some of those papers. Uh, but he mainly was concerned about adults, though. And where I think we might need to go now is 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 adults walking off the street and want to be baptized as part of, of, of entering into the kingdom of God and being a part of our church. I grew up um, in a closely knit church community in Troy, Chilani, and all the other churches except the Anglican church had a pool, a baptismal pool inside the church. Um, some of them, the choir stood on top of the pool and people would be baptized in a service if they so desire. Are we going to be going that route? Um, the, the, the route, I, I recall the Bishop de Souza and other bishops have said it, that the baptism can be done with a glass of water. It doesn't matter the quantity. The quantity is irrelevant. Baptism can be done, administered with a glass of water. I remember in, in a St. Cyprian Skewer, the Highgate Cure, we had a baptism that should take place at St. Michael's Church, Belfield, which had a pool. And for that week, there was no water in the community. When we arrived there the Saturday, um, still no water. And we had the candidates. I remember there was a, a 10 year old um, chap present, a 12 year old um, young miss. And we just got some buckets, um, put them in, in, the, in the, um, the area. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and pour the water on them, and then use the oil and anoint them. Right? So you can use a bucket of water. The quantity of water is, is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that water is, is poured and administered in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that, 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 is, that, that closes the issue. And as Anglicans, I would believe that we are all crystal clear on that. I, I would like um, just to make a point on the matter. Adults are not baptized. There are some denominations that will have a evangelistic meeting and somebody go up um, and, and, uh, and say they want to be baptized. And either that very moment, they, they are baptized. We, we. In fact, adults have to go through a period of, of study and reflection. In fact, adults who are being confirmed baptized, must attend the confirmation class and are baptized and confirmed um, short, within a day or two or on the same um, occasion. The, the, the real issue, I noticed a question that was asked about um, infant baptism now becomes uh, the, the, the real contentious matter. The early church never baptized infants unless they were part of the Christian family. You know. uh, let us be very clear about that. And it is not anticipated that we should be baptizing children who are not members of the Christian family. You cannot very well baptize an infant child whose parents are Hindus or Muslims. Um, and they do not believe believe that the child is now going to be incorporated in the life of Christ and in the family within the church. And that's why the early church chose God parents for the newly baptized. It is really the church that should do that, you know, it's not the family members. We have, we have become very, very relaxed in, in negotiating with families about who the godparents are. 
And perhaps that's another thing that we need to have a conversation around. Um, I see where um, someone is saying that I, I made mention that the, the parents and the priest will decide whether the, the child will be blessed or um, to, to be baptized. No, that's not what I said. I said that the, um, the booklet presently of our diocese indicates that the parents, along with the priest, will make the decision when the child will be ready to receive communion, right? So it is a priest and the parents that will make the decision when the child is ready to receive communion. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the Eastern, in the Orthodox church, the infant is baptized. The oil anointed by the bishop is used to anoint the child and the child receives the first communion by um, in intinction or just the host, as the case may be, depending on the situation of the child. So um, that, that's within the Orthodox Church. Um, Bishop made reference to the Roman Catholic Church and, and First Communion. We are now as a diocese and a province to establish what is going to be the protocol. And so with the, so far we are hearing that Baptism is the sacrament in which a child or adult is initiated into the faith of Jesus Christ, incorporated into Christ, become a member of the family of God, the church, inheritor of God's kingdom. So that provides the basis of our understanding of baptism. The can infant, I can I say something? Can I start to interrupt you? Start start to interrupt you. But I I, I notice um, Sandra Knight Reese is saying here, bless and anoint the children until they are ready for mature ministry. Um. I I I totally disagree with that. You know, to bless someone, blessing, certainly when the church um, offers a blessing, what are we doing when we do that? To bless is really to have a share in God's life. And the greatest blessing we could give is baptism where that child, we signify that that child now is a member of the household of God. Why would we want to postpone that? Why would we want to postpone that until the child is conscious and is able to make um, a conscious decision on their own? Why would we want to deny them of that? They are already a member of our family, accepted that. Why would we want them to exclude them from, from that? I, 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 okay. I'm, I see your response. We were, to, we were to do that. I see your response. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Sisters and brothers, we have reached to that time before we are pitched off by the, um, the arrangement on the digital platform. I, I see where it indicates that we need to wrap up at this point in time. I, I was not aware we were given hour and a half. I thought we were going for maybe a little more. However, it is now that time. And so I would like to thank everyone for their participation in this um, discussion on baptism as a gateway to the Eucharist and the antecedent um, and the component of, of um, confirmation. Really appreciate your presence. And uh, with this is just the beginning. We are going to arrange for a, another meeting and it will be publicized. And we hope that once you hear about it, you will connect with us. I will now turn over to Sister Sonia Stewart Gordon from St. Luke's, who will um, give the vote of thanks and express our appreciation to Bishop Thompson. Good evening, everyone. 
On behalf of the St. Andrew Deanery Council, uh, members of congregations of the wider deanery, and if there are anyone, there's anyone here outside of the deanery as well, I just want to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to Bishop Thompson for taking time out of his very precious retirement to be with us here this evening as we seek to get clarity on the way forward with regards to the whole matter of baptism as a gateway to Holy Communion. Many of us here this evening has had um, serious concerns ever since we, this announcement was made. And as we have listened I'm sure that we have gotten some insights and food for thought that will facilitate further discussions on this very important aspect of our lives as members of the Anglican community. And as we continue to educate ourselves in this regard, the historical perspectives that have been shared, I'm sure will also assist us greatly as we continue the discussions. So Bishop Thompson, thank you very much again for facilitating this discussion this evening. We really appreciate it. And I also want to thank the WATC, we are the church for providing the platform that we have used to host this session. We thank you for that. Thanks again, and thanks to all who have um, spent this hour and a half with us as we seek to find answers. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, too. Thank you very much. And, and Sonia, look, the conversation has to continue. You know, it requires a lot more um, in-depth searching. And I challenge all of us who have been part of this conversation this evening to, to get material and, and, and to read and text me or email me and, and I, will, I will help to, um, to refer you to websites and, and resources that you could read. And I, and I recommend one of the easy reads really is Rowan Williams, Being Christian. Go get it on Kindle. Rowan Williams, being Christian, baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and prayer. Did you say Ron, R O H A N? R O W A N. Rowan Williams. He's a, he's a former Archbishop of Canterbury. Former. And he came here in. And he was in Jamaica. He was, we hosted him here in 2009. Yes. Bishop Thompson, can you just repeat the name of the book, please? The book is Being, B-E-I-N-G, Christian. Being Christian by Rowan Williams, R-O-W-A-N, Williams. And it's available on Amazon um, and electronically or, or hard copy. Okay, thank you. Yes, you, you you're see, most welcome. And you will see the mention and the in the chat being Christian by Ron Williams. Bishop, thank you again. Thanks mm -hmm. to everyone for being with us on the Vertel platform as we engage in this whole discussion on baptism, um, gateway to the Eucharist, and that of um, position of um, confirmation. Um, we are not going to leave it at this. We are going to look at arranging for another time when we can have further discussion. And uh, it is with the ongoing conversation that we will jointly come to a, a common understanding about this, um, the, the position that we are going, the direction we're going with as a diocese and a province. I now invite us to say the evening collect together. Light in our darkness, we beseech you, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
And also with you. Also with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you all very much. Sleep well. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye all. Bye all. Bye. Bye all. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Good to be bye, sure. bye bye. Bye everyone.